I draw comics. It's most of what I think about and spend quite a bit of time doing. Um, here's a comic mm -hmm. that I made about thinking about comics, you know, um, and just kind of how present they seem to be in my thought process. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I when I put this presentation together, you know, I was kind of thinking about being in college because I went to art school too. Um, and kind of how I first started making comics and all that. So I included a bunch of stuff in this presentation um, of work I made in college and when I first started making comics and stuff. Um, this is this is recent, but um, you but know. Where's the? Should I go to the older stuff? You can like tell me when to stop. Yeah, if you just yeah stop right here. This is um. I go up one. Go go up a little bit. Go back to that. I'm so punk. The first one. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. A little, one more. Mm -hmm. Just one more up. Oh. Oh. Possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is the first comic I ever printed. Um, I had drawn. I started drawing comics in 2016 um, when I was 1920, and then this is the first one that I printed in. 2017. Um, I had like an apprenticeship through an offset press that was available through my school. Um, so I was able to print whatever I wanted on an offset machine, which was pretty convenient and epic. So um, I made this comic. It was like a little eight page mini and I printed it. Um, and I started going to little comic festival type stuff around Chicago. Um, and I would either sell them for $5 or I would give them away for free to people whose work I liked. Um, yeah, Josh is zoomed it in. Um, and it was nice because I, since I was putting it out myself, I was able to really control how much it cost me to make it and how much it cost me to sell it. So, um, it was a great way to figure it out. I love self-publishing. I really highly advise that y'all try that. Um, that's what most of this talk is. But uh, and then if you scroll down to the next page, you'll see like the next edition of it. Um, when I sold out of the first and gave away most of the copies of the first, I printed it again, this time in two colors, because I like, was learning how to use the machine better <laughs> and I could do it in two colors. Um, Josh has a tattoo from the most recent edition of this comic, which is fun. Um, yeah, I ended up putting out three issues of this and then in 2022, I compiled them all together in like a nice little floppy six dollar comic um and if you scroll down there's some some updated ones you know i when i first started making them i didn't really know how to use photoshop super great so um the colors are a bit wonky so i recolored all of them and you know rescanned them so i was scanning them at like 200 dpi when they should absolutely be scanned at 600 dpi no matter what for anything you ever want to print it should be 600 dpi or it's just going to look bad, you know, um, which was a, a learning curve for me. Um, and if you keep scrolling down, you know. Are there any examples that we can see? Like, is there anything that stands out about these older ones that we can see here that shows your your, your lack of uh, Photoshop knowledge? Um, maybe if you like see like the, that cover with um, like if you go up from there just like a little bit because those are scans of just the actual print, but that, you know, you can kind of see like, oh, it looks nice in the print, but um, yeah. on the computer, it looked a little messed up. Um, and if I wasn't just printing this all in one color in magenta on an offset press, it like if I had laser printed, it would not have looked as good. Um, you know, like, and I also, they were very little. And if I had printed them out bigger, they would have been very pixely. Excellent. Um, was it your line, not just yeah. the line too? Yeah, which is why I had to, you know, rescan everything. But so you did, them, you did them by hand and then you colored digitally? 
Yeah, I ink almost everything by hand. Um, with the, At this point, I use almost the same. I use a G-nib for almost everything because I think it's the best one um, for me and for the way I like to draw. Um, I like to use it for everything except for panels. I usually do panels with either like a 0.8 or a 0.7 pin, um, you know, and then I, I use a genome for everything with preferably like speedballing, but if I'm in a, in a crutch, I'll use something else just, you know, um, yeah. So, and then you scan them at 200. And did you understand about Photoshop layers and stuff? I didn't know about layers until later, as as will be shown in this presentation. <laughs> but um, a, a huge a huge thing that was great was when Jessica Campbell showed me how the magic wand worked on um, Photoshop. That was a big day for me. So very thankful to her for that forever. Um, yeah. So like I don't know. Example, you were using the like the the paint bucket tool, right? Just the paint bucket tool, and that's it. So that's like like that pink in the ear. That's probably like a random result of the paint bucket tool, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it rings a lot of bells with me um, mm -hmm. talking to people, and especially these days because people don't do people tend to go to Procreate before they do Photoshop. And the settings of Procreate are about 150 DPI. And you have to change the settings. And then if you're using uh, one of the other, like um, there's other like, like kind of bootleg, not bootleg, but there's, there's other like um, uh, off brand versions of Procreate. Um, Manga Studio. And this is the same thing. You have to Google how to change the settings. And it's it's a real labyrinth, like so much digital stuff. Because I started showing students how to change the digital procreate settings. And then sometimes even that's not enough because I go in and some students, you'd see immediately their line go from being pixelated to it being really sharp. And then sometimes it wouldn't work until we had to fool around. And then you had to realize that some of them, you had to hit 600 DPI or 300 if they could don't have enough memory. And then you had to also go and select like 69,000 pixels. Whereas before, even though it's 600, it was giving you less pixels. So it, it's like, it's yeah. such a drag and it's like, it's so, um, it's like going through a bureaucracy. Yeah, it sounds like it. Jeez, that's mm -hmm. hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always just ink stuff, um, like on a piece of paper and then scanned it and then edited in like the color and stuff in Photoshop. I've never used Procreate or Manga Studio um, because I had, when I was in school, I got Photoshop for free through my school. So I thought, you know, why not use the free thing that I get? Um, and now me and me and my girlfriend, Lily, we just split a Photoshop subscription. So it's, it seems fine, but um, you know, Definitely just, if your school gives you anything for free, use it, you know, <laughs> you gotta. But yeah, I, that's really unfortunate that like the, the set settings on Procreate and um, Manga Creator or whatever are like 150 DPI. That's never gonna look good in print. Well, yeah, you can see their psychology is that they're just geared to think that people only wanna do work for the internet. Mm. And like a lot of people do, you know, like I, I can't knock anyone who wants to do only web comics, but I do know, I know someone whose web comic got then reprinted into a book and it took um, the book designer for the, the book, like the most amount of time she's ever had to spend on a project making the files be ready for print, you know? So I think just- Because probably the original files were never high res enough. I wonder what they had to do. It took, it took her a very long time to like kind of, I think she might've like even just traced everything like in Illustrator. Like so it was some elaborate process that, I mean, the book turned out amazing. So that's great, but I don't know. It took, seemed like a, I don't know, 
hindsight is 2020 or whatever. This is the, the new cover for I'm So Punk um, from the most recent edition. So, um, you know, it was, it was nice to go through all the old strips and kind of, you know, yank the ones that I didn't think are funny anymore and maybe like clean up some of the older ones that I'm like, this, this is good. This is a nice image. Um, and I, I redrew one or two of the panels just because I can draw better now, which is nice. Um, but yeah, and you can scroll down a little bit more. There's the, that's the cover and then the next is the inside cover, I think. Yeah, that's what the inside cover looks like. Um, there's, there's Josh's tattoo, yeah. <laughs> Pretty sick. <laughs> Yeah, the tattoo of that. <laughs> I thought it was so funny. Um, <laughs> that that joke is from the original one. I just redrew it because it looks better like that. You know, um, the original drawing looked bad. But this is um this is an old page from a comic I made when I was in college. Um, from this comic. It's very similar to what I'm doing now. It was a one person comics anthology and I, I called it sweaty. And each page was just like a different gag joke. I think there was like two four page comic stories in it. And I put out two issues um, and I just offset print it because I could offset print anything. Um, and so it was just little gags like this and then spot illustrations. Um, and yeah, I just, I wanted to throw in some stuff that like what my work looked like when I was first starting out, you know, um, this so was like maybe a year into drawing comics for context. So that's like 2016, 2017? Yeah, this is like 2017-ish. Um, and then the next one's like a page from another comic around that time. I was just trying to self-publish as many little like eight to 12 page comics as I possibly could because that seemed like the way to do it for me. Um, it was the way that I learned how to write too, because trying to write like a 100 page graphic novel as your first comic, some people can do it, but I definitely couldn't. And it just seemed like a way to work, spend a lot of time on a project and then get burnt out halfway through and not be able to finish. Um, so having actual little comics that I could make for cheap and sell for cheap and make in a, a normal amount of time seemed like the way. Um, and then I also started working on a risograph machine that I had access to. So I made a comic that was like half offset printed and half risographed. These are two pages from it, not from the same story, but just, you know, next to each other. So I thought that would be fun. Um, yeah, this is more college work. Um, what, yeah, this, this is, and I, I come from, I come from like a painting background, a painting and printmaking background. So that's what I was doing before I was making comics. So I, I started like kind of doing some larger paintings that were kind of like comics. So I threw that in here. Um, that's something I could definitely be down to revisit later on. Um, and I was learning a lot about like color theory and stuff doing that. So pretty, pretty fun stuff. Um, you know. um, where would you pick up tips on typography? So it sounds like you had, if you did graffiti, you kind of came from like a strong typography background before you even started doing comics, right? Graffiti? Um, I only did a little bit of like painting on building stuff in like high school, but um, you might have misheard me, but um, like a, a painting about. and painting background, what did you yeah, I thought I think I must have heard you. I thought you said you came from a graffiti background. Oh no, like a painting and printmaking type background. Oh. But I, I did I did a little bit of that in high school with my friends, and it was fun, you know. Um, and I I really do like typography from graffiti and stuff. That's definitely I've definitely looked at a lot of it when thinking about text, to, just to like for readability. I feel like you know they really know what they're doing, graffiti artists. Yeah. Um, cool. It's in all of your stuff. It's like your lettering is really solid, and then there's like typography, that title, and I think there's another one. Yeah, I'm 27 there. It's like really confident typography. Yeah. Comics, like you're really interested. You know, comics are always a balance between the image and the word, 
and it's like you kind of veer into thinking about about it almost like poster art. Yeah. I yeah I I really I really have been thinking about I have really bad handwriting um and so when I started making comics I had to really spend a lot of time practicing hand lettering and I had to make it fun for myself because otherwise it was gonna look bad so I've spent a lot of time thinking about typography and making it very readable and good and in a way where it's incorporated and thinking of it more as part of the drawing rather than just like the text has really been helpful for me um because if people can't read your comic then they're not going to you know for the most part <laughs> that makes sense like yeah. i try and make it as easy as possible for people to read my stuff and be able to tell what what word is what um yeah, and then these are like, this is um, on the left, that's like a large color pencil illustration that I did when I was trying to figure out how to maybe like make some color pencil comics. Um, and I used Posco paint markers as well for that. And then on the right, that was like an early risograph experiment of like a accordion fold comic that I made. Um, that I don't think was very much so a success, but it was a learning experience for sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I like, I like both of these a lot. But, I, I would not recognize that as, as colored pencil. That's such an interesting use of colored pencil. Yeah, that's colored pencil and, and paint markers. So it's a combo. Okay, so but, so like on the right side of the face, that's paint marker and the hair is paint marker probably. Hair's, um, the hair's colored pencil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um I I did um my high school AP portfolio in marker and color pencil, so it was fun. And then as an adult, I wanted to relearn it. But um yeah, and these are two two more pages from college. This might be the last page from college work. Um, but yeah, so kind of on the left is like uh, once I got pretty okay at offset printing and I was making this big like 17 by 11 size book. Um, mm. and these are two pages from that um, that I printed. Um, so yeah. How many copies of that print? I think I made a hundred. It was kind of like my senior thesis, but we didn't really have a thesis. Um, because it was a weird art school, um, but it, it would have served as mine if I had had one. Um, I spent most of the year making it and I sold it at some, every once in a while, I'll see a copy in someone's apartment and I'll be like, whoa, you have that? I like, I don't even think I have a copy of it anymore, you know, so it's nice to see. I, I don't know, I printed a lot of it, but. Um, yeah, and these are these are like kind of my final drawings from college down below um, underneath this of kind of like going back to black and white work and really enjoying that. Um, I, I really like I was drawing a lot in pencil. Um, I made a pencil comic that I really enjoyed that I would totally go back to sometime. Um, I like how pencil looks. It's just hard to get it to scan right and to print right. But um, I, I read um, the Eleanor Davis book, You, a Bike and a Road, around this time, and I really liked it. And it was a really amazing pencil comic. So I was trying to do some pencil. Yeah. Whose work? I missed that. Uh, Eleanor Davis's You, a Bike and a Road. Yeah, yeah. And do you, what, what's your impression of your experience in college that you would pass on to these pre-college students? Like, did you, looking back, what was, uh, what was the ratio positive to negative for you? Um, I had a lot of po positive experiences and a lot of negative experiences. Um, the really positive ones were when I was in a class of people and everyone cared and everyone was like kind of giving it their all and participating in an even normal good amount like I feel like that was always when it was the most productive you know we had like a teacher who was teaching us 
and we had students who we could learn we could learn from each other and balance ideas out and i i still have some groups of friends i made in in those classes where when one of us is working on a project or something we can send it to the other ones and get legitimate feedback um so like you know art school you you get what you put into it so if you work hard and actually do it you will get something out of it and if you don't you won't you know like i don't know um i really would suggest looking into as soon as possible the different things the art school has to offer like facility wise like does it have a printer like a fancy printer you could use does it have a book binding station does it have a service bureau can you get a job at the service bureau and then print for free can you like all sorts of stuff like does it have even like my school had like a full 3d printer and laser cutter that people used all the time like i and i i felt like you know sometimes i wouldn't even find out about a machine that was available on campus until i was like a junior or senior that i would have definitely been using when i was a freshman or sophomore if i had known so like figuring out what is actually available is really really good i it sounds silly but um yeah. i feel like it's hard to know especially at bigger colleges like what's up you know um, does that make sense oh, that was a great answer i mean it's both you i like your front loaded with such a positive impression a lot of times um people, uh, myself included, I think like I'm kind of front loaded with um, here's what's wrong with the program, but here's what's wrong with my experience. And uh, <laughs> everything you said is like really constructive. I thought that was a great answer. Yeah, something else that um, I started doing kind of in the latter half of my college experience is in the beginning, I, you know, um, I, I also went to an art middle and high school. Uh, so it was kind of like a natural progression for me. Um, but I spent the first two years kind of building, figuring out what I didn't want to do. And then by the latter half, when I knew I wanted to be a cartoonist and I knew I seriously wanted to pursue like a printmaking knowledge on top of that, I, I started any project I was assigned like once I knew what I was doing, I would try and figure out how to make projects I was assigned into actual pieces that I could use in a portfolio of work and like sell, you know, like if I could turn a com, like I have to make a three panel gag comic, I would incorporate that in a comic book that I would print and sell and make money from, you know. Um, so that was kind of like the latter half of college, I was like, I'm making this work for me and I'm gonna get a grade, but I'm also mostly making it for me, which I think improved the quality of the work and made me more driven to do it, you know? <laughs> if that makes, yeah. I mean, I know everybody's different, but compared with other artists I've talked to, because I've done this, um, this kind of uh, guest artist thing with mm -hmm. other people in illustration and comics, I did, Ben Mara did it years ago, and Matt Rhoda has been doing it a lot recently. And it's always interesting. Sometimes it's really encouraging to me to see how um, far away, how much they were still gestating and evolving at that period. Yeah. Like Matt is an amazing master of color, of color. And he got out of school and he's doing all black and white work. And he told me that he didn't really start his color education until after school. And yeah. Ben was also, he didn't know quite like, he was kind of circling around what his style was going to be. And that always makes me feel better. Like I, um, like I came out of school with a full comic as well, but it wasn't, it wasn't in color. So it's interesting to see how close, like how much, how much of where you are now is already like in evidence in your college work. Yeah, a fun reflection. At the time, I didn't think so at all, but now I'm like, oh dang, you know. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I uh, this project right here. This is an example of what I was talking about. Um, 
I had for, for Jessica Campbell's comics class, she was my comics professor. Um, she's a really talented, amazing cartoonist. Um, she's going to be at Comics Crossroads Columbus as a special guest, I think, next year. But um, she put out this book, Rave, with Drawn and Quarterly, that's really good, like last year. Um, but I did this project for her class. I think this was my last, one of my last projects in college, if not my last. Um, and it's a 12-page mini comic um, called Cool Girls Doing Things because I'm not the best at titles, or at least I, I wasn't then. Um, and the 12 pages of this ended up being what I sent to Silver Sprocket to pitch the panel that's under this, um, my book Girl in the World, which was my debut graphic novel. Um, and I pitched that to them. I changed like the end, because in the original mini comic it ends, but in this book it's like a 70 page book, so it doesn't end, obviously. Um, and I used a college project and turned it into a book. So it worked out pretty well. But, um, you know, and we I can talk about pitching to publishers or anything too that y'all would want to know about. If you have any questions about that, I'm happy to um, answer all that. I know it can be kind of intimidating um, to do that, but I, I don't know. You can do questions at the end. Yeah, cool. Yeah, sounds good. But um, I got I got set up with Sprocket because I had been self publishing all of those mini comics on my own and tabling at Zine Fests and Comic Fests and they were at the Zine Fest and Comic Fest and I would just you know always give them my comics because Avi who runs Silver Sprocket was friends the cartoonist that I knew and they were like ha ha they would like this and I was like okay if anybody would like this I'll give it to them you know I, I wasn't really doing it with the the expectation of being published by them but um they would also just always give me like a free comic in return which was a great trade and it was always like a really nice fun book and then eventually they were like oh you should pitch to us and I did and that's how that happened. But um, it felt very organic. So I highly recommend self-publishing and tabling and stuff. Um, these are some pages from the book. Yeah, we can tell them more about, I mean, these these kids, I'm not sure, you know, about Mo the Mocha Fest. Um, so there's a lot of independent comics and print and graphic novel festivals that are really can be very instrumental in letting your uh, development snowball, meeting people, uh, starting to find artists who you who you like. Most of these people are very willing to talk to other artists. What I find about um, what I find about those festivals is that you feel like everybody in the audience is also a cartoonist, and like people outside our community, I think they'll look down on that. They're like, you know, they think that there should be a bunch of consumers and that the artist should be elite. And I feel like that's the way, that's okay that things are like that, that everybody, you're doing work and then you're grow, you're encouraging other people to do work. Like it is, um, that's kind of ideal, but I can see how people who are super mega capitalists would look at that and be like, what, you're never, you know, you're all just like it on the same level and see that as a negative. And, but it, it is true, we go to the festivals, I see tons of my students, and I see my students become exhibitors. And then I see, you also see older cartoonists who are just as willing to meet younger people and then, you know, uh, keep, yeah, keep things in the community, go on. Even more so than it being like a chance to meet a publisher you like, I just, I, and I, you know, the publishers that you like, at these fests, they're working, they are busy. It is not the time to like pitch a book or anything, you know? It's just the time to like give them a comic and buy something from them and say something nice. Like, yeah. I, these, the best thing about the fests, it, it's, it's a great example, it's a great chance to get new work and be exposed to new work that you didn't know about and to just make friends who are also cartoonists or who are people who are involved in the comics community. Like, you know, 
you could start exhibiting there. It could be your first year. You could become friends with someone who's also exhibiting there for the first time. And then five years later, you're both making comics and doing a great job, you know? Like, it's just a great place to get to know people. Um, and when you go to enough of them, you kind of see the same faces <laughs> and then you kind of know each other, you know? So, it's yeah. But. And Mocha Fest, everybody, is it's very close to here. Um, this school is involved with it. SBA is involved with it. I think it's fifteen dollars to get in, or five dollars, or something. And it's very overwhelming. Last year, they had like sixty thousand people came through it. It's a big auditorium. Is that the right word? Yeah. Tons of tables, uh, and everybody has this kind of do-it-yourself aesthetic. Uh, and then there's all and the rubbing elbows of people who are more like. Uh, in the more, um, you know, um, more legitimate like businesses that, and so you have both people who are doing it themselves and people who are businesses. I think it's, you can have, uh, you can find gold in either of those camps. And that seeing that was really important for me getting into what I do. Um, you see it, you see other people are doing it. And if it's what your dream is, you see that you can do it too. And you do share information with other artists and um, you always find out new stuff. Um, and there's just the, the attribute that you talk to people and you know, it's not like there are people, if you're in that community, then there's kind of a level of comfort. I feel like people are usually uh, feel like they're, I don't know, part of a, a part of a community. I can't think of another word for community. But like it tend oh what? Yeah, an ecosystem. I like that. Good one all. And <laughs> and um yeah, I find that it is less excruciating than like parties I've been to, for example. Because it you all you have to do is like pick up a little thread and all of a sudden you have all this commonality with another person because they're obsessed with the same things you are. Every once in a while there will be a fest with the worst vibes. But besides that, it's usually like 90% of the time, it's pretty good, you know? And then every once in a while, you're like, why am I at, this This fest had good vibes, but like, why am I at Grand Rapids Zine Fest? That one was fun, but like something like that, like a, like a little one that someone and their friends organized that then you're like, oh, I don't know anybody here and everyone who's here is kind of doesn't care, you know, or whatever. But that one, that one was good. That's, that was just, you know, trying to think of a random small town city type thing, you know. Yeah. But sometimes they're the best too, like the little ones, you know. Yeah, so, I always, always shift to that. I always find that it's healthy. If you have any kind of uh, esteem from your community and then you're outside that safety net, and you see that you're in a world where you don't have any clout, I always think that's kind of healthy. I think so too, yeah. It's good, you know? What was it? I don't best? know, I worked, at, I, worked at, um, I worked at a comic book store for a couple of years after I graduated. And, you know, it. I feel like it was really good to see kind of like doing events there, you know, and like, you know, you have this great, huge artist who you care about and, you know, maybe 30 people show up and that's great, you know, like just kind of like the different turnouts for stuff, like it always keeps you humble, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know, but. Yeah. And then um, I put out Girl in the World in 2019. And then in 2020, um, I was working at the comic book store, but then, you know, the pandemic started and um, I got really depressed and I didn't make any work for a year and a half. And then I bought a risograph. So I have a risograph now so I can print my own stuff at home. Um, and I printed this little like illustration magazine um, for people who subscribe to my Patreon. Um, which was a fun way to get me to start thinking about printing again. And then if you scroll down, um, you know, oh, um, oh yeah. Then I started thinking about um, pee pee poo poo. Um, 
And if you continue to scroll down, you'll see the first cover of it. Um, I self-printed and self-published this comic called Pee Pee Poo Poo, um, which was a one-person comics anthology. Uh, my girlfriend, Lily, is a screen printer. Um, so she helped me screen print the covers and I printed the guts. Uh, Everybody remember, I was introducing the students to Ernie Bushmiller and Nancy, uh, that character we talked about. That's a slug of Nancy uh, in the corner. At least I believe it is. Yeah. Um, you are you a big Nancy fan? I'm a, I got a Nancy tattoo over here. Yeah, I'm a huge Nancy fan. What do you think of the new of what Olivia James is doing? I think she's a genius. Yeah. Yeah, I'm on Team Genius. Um, but I, I love that she. I feel like uh, I love that she took on a different name to do the book. I feel like I didn't. Quite, I don't even know where my head was at. Like seven years ago when she took it over because now I really see it and maybe it's because uh franchise the franchise you see how people freak out when you take a legacy character and especially if it's a woman and they take them over and people lose their minds because there's so much toxicity in the comics community in in uh mainstream comics community and so yeah. I love that she did that now because she just saw she saw the writing on the wall before she even started the comic it was really smart, you know? And everyone has like a guess on who it is. And I think that's a fun game too, you know? Yeah. I'm like, who is this? Is it Daniel Glaus? No, but like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think it's fun to be like, oh, I wonder who she is. Ah. But um, have you all read the new Nancy as a class? Say that again. Have you guys read the new Nancy as a class? Have I done what Nancy? Have I? Have you all been reading the new Nancy like as a class? Just scrape the surface. I haven't brought in my books, but we've had like stuff clipped around the class, and I gave them an assignment where I was showing them your stuff and showing them Ernie Bushmiller stuff, and we were uh, I was kind of pointing out everybody has those barrel torsos and two arms, cylinder arms. And that sturdiness is such an interesting choice and actually kind of helps you with shadow potentially because when you yeah. have people, right? Um, do, you, do you mind taking us through this? Would you read this to us? Yeah, sure. Um, it's called Long Time No See Buddy. Um, and it goes, hey, been a while. <laughs> Hope you're doing all right. I'm doing so good right now. So good. Um, I've finally gotten into cooking. I know that's something you pretend to care about these days since you've been watching quite a few Bon Appetit videos. Silent panel. And then... <laughs> So how have you been? How are the kids? Awesome. Was this during COVID? Was this during pan? Yeah, yeah. This is 2021. Um, this is during COVID. This was after I was just so um, depressed and not talking to anyone for like months, you know? <laughs> like. This was the first thing I made after all that, um, or during all that, really. Um, and that's like the introduction for Pee Pee Poo Poo. Um, I think in every issue, the first page of comics is going to be kind of like a person talking to the view, like the reader kind of introduction page. And then it gets into the different stories and stuff. Um, this comic series is very, referential to comics that came before it each cover is referencing a different like comic cover that's come before um that are famous for different reasons um and some of them are done um with love and affection and some of them are done in disgust so this one is a tribute to daniel klaus's art school confidential that he put out in the original eight ball series that he did um he was a 
Chicago cartoonist, but I think he went to Pratt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, went to, he went to school in New York. I can't remember if it was SBA or Pratt. It was Pratt. Uh, because he used to come down Pratt. and he used to come down and I think sit in on Harvey Kurtzman's classes. Cool. That yeah. sounds right. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um and so I I really liked that strip because when I was in art school is when I read it and I thought that, you know, I could do a little updated version um, for someone being in art school in 2019 or whatever. Um, so you drew this, it was in, I think it's six page story from this comic, um, which is I think maybe a page longer than his, but I, I wanted to draw more. Um, and he uses a bit too much text than I personally like to use on pages. So I was, you know, kind of overdoing it in the way that he does. But, um, you know, I had like, there's a whole bit in it about the different archetypes of different art school classmates, um, the, the art school polycule that no one can understand, uh, or at least I can't. Um, and then I also had this story in it called One Beer that, it's about two girls getting a beer. Um, it turns into getting a lot more than just one beer, but you know, it was it was my first time experimenting with doing an ink wash and like mm. painting ink into a comic, and I really liked the effect. Um, I did it on these big sheets of watercolor paper. Uh, and I think I'm gonna experiment with that a little bit more, um, which is exciting. And then I self-published it, so I Rizzo printed it. And then as a little added bonus for people who ordered it from me, I threw in um, a little half issue. So it's like a little like four page comic called Pee Pee Poo Poo, 69 and a half. Um, and there's, if you scroll down, you'll see a Nancy tribute that I put in there, um, like a very direct Nancy tribute. So, um, yeah, I was I was thinking about Nancy, but oh wow, yeah, I've never seen that one. That's um, Sikoriak's uh, cover. Yeah, and then this is um, uh, the the comic got nominated for an Ignatz Award, and I wanted to draw something to okay. celebrate that and get people to vote for something as silly sillily named as pee pee poo poo for an Ignatz Award. So I drew this, um, that's based off of that cover, yeah. There's so many layers to this, I love it. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, I included like the ink drawing and then the, the drawing after I scanned it and edited it. And these are some posters I made um, that I printed out and would include when people either ordered the comic or just put them up around Chicago. I ended up self-publishing an edition of a thousand of this comic because it was the pandemic. I had the time. Yeah. Lily helped me and we screen printed a thousand of these. So that was crazy. Um, and I mostly used paper that I had still had from school because I worked in the print shop and people would just buy a ton of paper for their projects and then not use them. And when it came around for like the semester to be over, there was all this paper. So I would just take home these reams of paper. So I printed this almost for free. I think we spent like 200 bucks on some cardstock. So we printed a thousand copies of this comic for like 200 bucks maybe, but um, felt good. And then after I sold out of that um, Silver Sprocket, was like, obviously we want to print this. Um, you didn't have to fold a thousand copies of a comic in the first place. Like we could have printed this for you. And I was like, oh, I didn't want to bug you during the pandemic. But um, so then they did the reprint and they're going to take it over from here on out. It's going to be a series. Um, I think we're going to put out three issues a year is the plan. This came out this past March, um, this nice newer printed, Kind of thing um, it has like some spot gloss on the cover their book designer Karina Taylor is really really talented um, and helped me like, make it look nice and then this came out in April um, it's the next 
the next volume in this series. Um, I included the process drawings on the on the right side of like a scan of the inks and then a scan of the inks with like some black and then the final the final cover. Um, and this one's based off of a Klaus eight ball cover as well. Um, the Do, you punky. Do you remember what issue I could show them the original real quick? Oh yeah. Um, I got it. I got it written down somewhere. Um, it's um, I think it's number thirteen. Yeah, it's number thirteen. So that's a good issue. I'll show it later. I don't know what window I have open here. I have a guide with that lately. Okay, so let me go to. I lost my Gmail window. Um. Wait. Oh yeah. Okay. Now I got to go back in. I shouldn't have done that. Now I got to start over. Oh, there we go. It's still open. Nice. And then this is a strip from it about Chicago guys being silly. You know, um, kind of a situational comic. <laughs> what, um, I really like the red and the blue together. Mm. Those are the Chicago colors. Oh. It's white, red, and blue like that, yeah. And then this is like a more personal comic from it. Um, when I was experimenting with the blue. Um, and this one, I love, I love this comic. And then these are some pages from a comic in it that's about doing your taxes that I think is the best comic from this issue. Um, you know, doing your taxes is pretty hard, so. Um, yeah, I like so many things about this. The red spot color. Uh, you see your print experience. It's like you're getting as much as you can out of one red. So you only have to do like one pass with it, I guess in in print uh print traditionally in print yeah it's so good and everybody you can see that a lot of caroline's stuff there's the iconic perspective that we, we spent this morning talking about perspective and perspective like alternatives and one of the big ones that the with cartoonists is we love to do overhead iconic perspective so i i noticed it this whole all the time for this pdf i mean you just make perspective work for you like your you um this one i don't even know what you call it when it's when like everything is kind of laying on the bottom of the picture plane but a lot of cartoonists do that as well yeah i don't know what you call it either but i like it yeah it's so, a little short well my friend started doing it and he said he did it because the guy from tintin does it all the time I have some Tintin playing cards around here somewhere, but I honestly haven't read that much of Tintin. Kind you of actually a, I haven't really read that much of Tintin. I, I, need to. It's good. I haven't either. Um, I've looked at it. I think I, I wish I was, I wish I'd had copies of it when I was like nine years old. I would have loved it. Same. Yeah. I only read like Naruto when I was nine years old, you know? So the whole thing. This is the new, this is the secret. It's the new issue. It's coming out in November um I think pre-orders are about to drop for it it's a reference to the women's comics anthology the first issue of that um I really respect them I think that, that issue is good um it's it was the first comic that ever had um a story about a lesbian coming out which I felt was cool um so I decided to have this issue be kind of referencing that. Uh, um, so you've had like three issues of pee pee poo poo, but the numbers are all like what well, four issues, right? And it's like the number. This, this, is the, this is the third issue. The fourth one comes out next year, but this is the third one. Yeah. So the first one's sixty nine. The second one's four twenty. The third one is eight zero zero eight five. I think the fourth one is going to be nineteen eighty four. I'm just you know having a good time. The very last one is going to be the actual number that it is. And that's the joke. That's funny. But, yeah. 
I gotta, I gotta make it fun for myself, you know? Um, yeah. And this is, uh, the title page for the next issue that will be coming out in November. This is all sneak peek. So, you know, keep it, um, keep it but, um, take this part out if you want. No, it's cool. You can include it. I'm going to post it all on Instagram, so it's safe. But um, and yeah, and this one's already on Instagram. So this is an excerpt from one of the comics in it. And it's called Dudes Rock. It's Dudes Rock. But, and then this is an excerpt of one, the, the first one in it that's called Victoria's Secret. And it's about being 13 and um gay and being afraid to walk into victoria's secret so. and we you're back to doing wash here right yeah this is me get doing wash again yeah i got more watercolor paper i feel like it's like the wash looks slightly better too because i i learned how to do it a little bit more <laughs> you know what um, um how many how many hours a day do you have like an average day and how much of it do you spend drawing um, it depends. Some days are more like for writing. So I don't, or some days I'll write a little bit in the, I feel like the best schedule for me is writing a little bit in the morning, drawing something I was working on the day before, and then like thinking about what I was writing at night. So in the morning I can wake up and edit it. If that makes sense. I gotta, sometimes I gotta think on it because otherwise it, the dialogue comes out a little weird. So yeah uh it really it depends i feel like i i just started working on a a big graphic novel and i'm i'm trying to have that be like i wake up early i work for five hours i have like a two hour break and then i work for like two hour two or three hours later in the day type of thing so i, I feel like i get bad about just sitting down and working and working and working and then suddenly it's 8 p.m and like i need to go outside you know <laughs> like so i it, it depends <laughs> so this one yeah this tell, tell us about the perspective here because we've looked at kind of distorted perspective and kind of working around traditional perspective but this is about as close to architectural perspective i think as you're going to get in this world would you say that this is correct? Did you block it out, like finding the vanishing point and those other, yeah. Yeah, this one took me a long time because I was doing that. Um, because I really wanted this one. It's the part two of this story that starts in PPP 420 about a girl who is going out at night in Chicago and her worst roommate texts her. And most of the jokes in it are informed a lot by the actual place that it's in. Um, so I tried to put a lot of emphasis on people being able to recognize what the locations that the people are in are in. Um, so I, I took my time with the perspective. And you know, and, and especially because in, in other comics in the same issue, I have like the classic cartoon perspective, like. I like there to be kind of a difference in the look of some of the stories in these anthologies. So I try and, you know, kind of change it up a little bit. But um, I think this is pretty typical of comics is that we often will really nail a location in a, they call this a half of a splash page or the large chapter page. And you see it again here. And this is where you really draw everything in the location. And then you, the smaller frames, um a lot of times people will just show a fragment of the lower of the location but this one we're jumping from location to location so you're doing a lot of establishing shots and cramming yeah. here you are cramming something that's almost as elaborate as what you have here into a very small panel yeah that's oh. navy Pier, chicago so i tried to really get the perspective right and I don't know, a lot of the times when I'm walking around, I'll just take a photo of something so that way I can draw the photo later, you know, and like have that perspective and know what's kind of around. So I love how specific, all the weird kind of 
designy, architect, modern, kind of faux modernist, disposable, whatever design of airports is, so, is represented so well here. Yeah, it's just O'Hare, you know. And then this at the very end of this little PowerPoint, um, I thought I'd include some stuff from my pitch to John and Quarterly. Um, because I'm going to be working as PP Poo Poo is coming out. Um, I'm also working on a larger continuous story graphic novel for the Montreal based publisher, John and Quarterly. They do really good work. I, I really like a lot of the books that they put out, and I've been reading them for a long time, and I'm very excited to be working with them. Um, and when I pitched them this book a little, a couple months ago, um, I included like some pages that I can't show y'all yet, but um, also this kind of cast chart to like tell who's dating who and who's um, living with who and who works with who and like kind of just to also for me so I could remember what each character is connected to each one when I'm writing it. Um, some of the names are going to change maybe, but um, I, you know, love, I love this description. <laughs> Infected tattoo, no job, clumsy. Yeah, totally. That's the those are, that Drew and Charlie are going to be the main characters. So most of the story revolves around them. Um, so gotta have a good a good little moment. Um, and this is the mood board that I included um, with the book of just memes and photos that I've taken, um, so that they could kind of understand. <laughs> what the what the vibe was but um wow you know awesome is this the last is this the end of it yep. yeah this is it you know uh thank you so much for doing this. i have so many questions i still have questions i want to ask you but this is like um uh, thank you for being like so like unpretentious and real and accessible about your work. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, by the way, do you you have a RISIC app? Do you do any printing for other people? Do you like take commissions? I at this moment in time, I don't. Um, I like every once in a while, I'll print like something for one friend. Yeah. You know, um, right now I'm thinking about branching out into it. I've just been so busy with stuff that doing printing other people's stuff on top of my own. Yeah. I would, I would, I, you know, when I print something of my own, if I mess it up a little bit, I don't care. But if I was printing other people's stuff and something came out wrong, I, it would bother me a lot, you know? We can talk about later if you're up for it, but I do a, a student anthology out of Rutgers and they give me a stipend. It's like 40, it's like 40 to, I think this year was over 60 pages and the printer said he wouldn't do that again. It was a little bit too thick, but it was, um, yeah, they give me uh, some money and I have like 30 students each doing, this last year it was like three pages each. So that's why it ended up being so big. But I'm always, I've my guy who did it this year, I'm not gonna be able to get in next year. So I might like bug you or ask yeah. you recommendations. Yeah. yeah, I don't have a perfect binder. So if it's that big, that might be a problem. But, uh, like, you know, go print the pages and mail them to you and then you can find them, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, Cause I can take them down to SBA and do that probably. Yeah. So class, so let's turn this on the students. Um, what kind of questions are people thinking of asking Caroline uh, in the aftermath of this presentation? Who has a question? Yeah, this. Do you want to come up here? Yeah, you can come closer. Oh, and I also want to show Caroline your work. Um, so um, I really like your style. So do you have any artists, do you know any artists that have like the same sort of style and style as yours to have some inspiration? Um, like similar styles to me? Um, probably, so, I mean, I can just tell you who I like and then like maybe it's kind of similar. Um, I don't know, I, I do, 
I do really like Grayson Bear's work. Um, we might collaborate at some point in time. We have, I think we have similar work and we always have similar haircuts, so it kind of works out, but um, their work is really good. They, they're in New York um, and they've been, they have, they have a book out with Silver Sprocket. Um, they're working on a book for Fanographics, but you just type in Grace and Bear into Instagram, it'll pop up. They just published um, with their friend on their micro press this book called um God, what is it called it's like public or something it was really their most recent comic is really really funny um and when i when i was in school i was looking at michael deforge's work a lot he's amazing um he i was first exposed to his work when i was like 14 or 15 because he did a lot of the character designs for uh for adventure time um but he has a lot of really great books out uh with koyama press and with drawn in quarterly and stuff um and then i really like allison bechtel's work really funny really good highly recommend um and yeah, I could keep going forever, but um, I don't know. Josh, do you have any ideas on whose work my stuff reminds you to? Well, say that again. Do I have any ideas what? Like other Aunt Anna Simmons for you? Stuff? It's really funny that you mentioned Michael DeForge because your early stuff that represented your palette, your, the first few pages you showed us, I was like, oh yeah, that's really DeForge like. And then it's funny. Yeah. Them. And this, I've never made the connection between you and Grace and Bear, but I really see, I agree, you two are on a really similar wavelength. Yeah, I really, I really want us to collaborate sometime. I think we're going to, so that would be fun. I think they're going to do a page or two for Pee Pee Poo Poo, but we were talking about maybe doing like a split comic together at some point. Your stuff's really funny. <laughs> so. Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, another question. Yeah. I almost called you Hillary again. I don't know how I'm getting it's like a record that skips. That skip comes up now. Yeah, um. Okay. Um, I don't want to like repeat anything or ask a question that's already been answered, but do you mind talking a little bit more about like the self publishing process? Like, how do you do that? Oh, it's it's super easy because it can be like kind of whatever you want it to be. But um, I would highly recommend just like quickly YouTube Googling like book, book, um, book format, you know, like how to print a zine. If you Google that, so that way you know kind of how to lay out the pages so that when you print them and fold them and staple them, all your pages are in order. But you know, it's, it's, if you have like a printer on campus you can use or even at home if you want to be really like old school xerox 90s about it like you just draw your comic you print it out and you staple it and you have a comic you give it to people you know like just kind of having like a physical comic out in the world is really nice um and you know you can pay people to print it better than you can if you want to um there's this website right now and it always changes what the cheapest fastest website is for printing stuff right now it seems like it's mixam.com so m-i-x-a-m.com um you can get like a run of 100 or 50 of a comic you you draw and make and they can print it nice and staple it for you and everything um and then you can have it and you can there are certain like comic book stores around the country, indie comic shops that take stuff on consignment. So you could email them or mail them your comic um, and then they could sell it for you and you can make money from that or just like kind of getting it out there in cities that you don't live in is really nice. I feel like I've been getting more so than thinking of it of this, of, as it, I'm not saying this right, the, uh, rather than thinking of it as some great money making venture, just like thinking of it as a place outside of where you live to send your comic to at the beginning. Um, and then eventually you'll make like 20 bucks and it'll be great. But um, yeah, 
Yeah, I would really, I feel like the zine community kind of has this stuff really together. And there are a lot of really good resources online for self-printing zines. So if you kind of think of zines and then you're like, okay, I'll just put a comic on this page instead of poetry or something. Like, that's totally the way to do it. Um, there's this zine that is now a book called Stolen Sharpie Revolution by Alex Rett that was really formative for me. Um, it was, it's really a helpful resource. Um, it's bound to be online in a PDF form somewhere. Um, if not, Silver Sprocket has copies available now. Um, that's a really good uh, self-publishing how-to guide, I'd say. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Josh? I think a good way, so here's the thing, it's funny that you're from a print background because as an outliner of print, I always, it always seems so unimmediate and there's all the calculations you have to do. You have to be a craftsperson. And um, a lot of people who talk to you about self-publishing, they'll tell you about doing your first scenes and they'll always tell you about that, you know, that system where you put like a vent in the middle of the paper and you turn it inside out. And I'm like, for God's sake, why? I think if you do that, you actually get less pages, by the way. And yeah. I had always heard that you could simply do this, where you take a sheet of paper, you fold it in four, and then on camera, yeah. And you split it here, cut, cut, and then you unfold it and you draw it in the order that you would imagine it to be in. So you imagine cover, inside front page, page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six. And what I had always meant to do this and it's like never got around to it. And then I was on jury duty like 10 years ago. And I was like, I'm trapped here. I guess I'll do a mini comic. I've always wanted to do one. And I did one on a small piece of paper. And then I printed that for quite a while. And then I did a couple more of them. So any, that's what's cool about comics. They're so portable, especially for New York, especially for Chicago, where it's not like the older model of an artist where, you know, you, you paint in an unheated studio, but you just scrape it by and you somehow are able to afford a painting studio on top of your apartment because it's like you're de Kooning. And that you, it's like that model doesn't really exist anymore. But comics are, can be really portable. So you could take this, and the only thing you got to know is that you got to keep a gutter like this on every page, and then you'll be good to go. And you take one of these, so you draw it, you patch it back together, you dump, do a double-sided copy, hit, hit 50 copies, and you can just print out like a, you'll immediately have a full stack of a book that you did. So maybe we could do that where the next comic you do, you think about an orientation like this, and you could... Could do it on this to do it on this you could even cut out bristol and glue it to this so that you have print in mind that's a goal of yours yeah that would be super easy that would be cool yeah that would be really y'all should do that and you know um in new york desert island comics yeah this forbidden planet you know i think they do sometimes Near my house, I've been there. I think they're pretty friendly for like small press as well. I think you can go in there and they'll be receptive. If you're like, I have this book, I want to see it. Will you take it on commission? But the really great resource is your publisher, Silver Silver Sprocket, because they're doing something un kind of unprecedented in that Silver Sprocket is a really good rising like small press, small publisher, not even small press. Like they, they're, they have their books get into bookstores, they go all over the world, they publish uh, really acclaimed cartoonists and um, they are really, like the value system they come from is very punk rock and very much about like helping people and not kind of being um, gatekeepers to comics. Yeah. So the recent thing that they're doing is, hey, we're in a pretty good place right now. Why don't you send us your mini comics and we're gonna go through them and see which ones we, want to publish and they are taking like a I don't even know what you call it but they're inviting mailbag of people in the audience out there who want to do comics so if you do something you do and it's exceptional they uh can, it's a very good likelihood that they will pay attention to it that's super cool I yeah know that. yeah yeah look, look up silver sprocket follow them on instagram the information is definitely out there i don't think the date's over i, I don't think that thing's over yet is it 
it just opened like yesterday. Um, wow. some some little insider gossip. Um, and if you're not ready just yet, what they've been working towards is having enough staff and having the resources to do an open submission once or twice a year. Uh, they're thinking last time I last time they told me this at the bar. So who knows? Um, yeah. Is that like they were thinking about like a summer winter submission time frame, you know, like so once a summer and once a winter, they would do open submissions for mini comics. Um, I would really recommend looking into it. Um, some things if you are interested in publishing with Silver Sprocket, some things that they are very interested in is re-editions of comics you've already put out so if you self-publish something and you were like oh this is great this is a good comic i like it other people like it maybe i'll send them a copy or two like maybe it's in their store because they would sell your mini comic for you that you self-publish um in their san francisco store um and let's say they have it and they like it they'll do the next edit. They like love to do a second edition of a successful first published scene, you know? So that's also something they would be looking to publish in their mini comic submission thing. So if you make a mini comic and then you submit it and then you're already printing it, like in worst case, they they are, you know, I'm, they're gonna get a billion submissions. So that's gonna be a whole thing. Um, but if they pass on it, you know, then you still have a comic you've made that is ready you know so that's nice but um they're great they're a great resource they have a bunch of stuff on their website um and i, I would highly look into just like stuff that they're putting out and getting your stuff in their store you know like they take a lot of work all the time <laughs> that they will sell for you <laughs> so. big okay thank you so much yeah of course totally how are you doing on time, Carolyn? You've been going for like an hour and a half. Are you are you okay? I'm doing good. Yeah, I mean, I just moved into a new apartment, and so I'm slowly unpacking stuff. But the Wi-Fi is working, which is which yeah. is all I can ask for. But yeah, how are y'all doing on time? Um, Either has a question. Uh, hi, like, do you have any tips for someone who's like trying to get into writing comics and like writing about like life experiences? Yeah, um, you know, like what kind of, like what kind of tip? Just like, like general writing tips? Like, um, just, like I'm neurodivergent, so I want to like write about like stuff that I've experienced around that and like just like kind of like educate people, but also like make jokes about it. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I practice, just practice a lot, I guess. Um, I would recommend looking into comics that kind of have a similar sort of narrative as the kind of stuff that you're really interested in writing about for yourself, finding people who do memoir. Um, my friend MS Harkness, I feel like is a very successful memoirist her her writing is really impactful for me um looking into and like uh, there's so many memoir cartoonist type stuff just looking into autobiographical cartoonists reading a lot of it and maybe also just reading normal memoirs and stuff too can be really helpful um because i feel like sometimes if you look at only comics for the genre that you're interested in, um, it can start to get a little repetitive. But yeah, just reading memoir, looking into memoir. Um, I really like like Michelle T's memoir type stuff. Um, she's a really cool writer. Uh, yeah, and just like starting small, you know, like starting at like, okay, this is a specific thing I would like to talk about in eight pages or 12 pages, you know? Um, that you can, I, I, I learned writing by just doing short comics. So that's what's been really helpful for me. Um, yeah, does that does that make sense? Um, happy to elaborate any more that you want. Uh, I'd also recommend make like a list, 
make like a list because we're going to do this as an assignment next week and it is about generating ideas so we'll take like a topic like i'm going to give a, an assignment where i ask you to think about things you're obsessed with and then if you want instead of just saying oh i'm obsessed right now with um you know uh with picasso or whatever you can do it as a catalog of like year by year. What were you the most obsessed with at five? What were you the most obsessed with? Even for me, every year I'm like obsessed with the new one. So it could be, that could end up being a short piece, or you might find that one of them going you more and you end up writing a frame about, um, a frame about like, uh, you know, a bunch of different obsessions and you zero in on one of them. Or um, I've done an assignment before where I ask people to list injuries. And then you're like, oh, uh, I did this at age five, and I did this at age 10, and I did this last year. And then those might turn into a story. So a good way to do it is to brainstorm. And when you take a category, you write down everything that comes to your mind. You're like, well, I'm obsessed with this comic and this album and this movie and this actor. And then you see which one draws you. And then you write down the one that appeals to you the most. You focus in and you start writing pages and scenes and acts. And that's a really good way to start writing. I'm, I'm seconding the lists. That's so true. <laughs> it is a really good way to do it, making lists like that. I, yeah, that's really smart. <laughs> also, um, there's the book. Um, Making Comics by Scott McCloud. It's not the greatest book, but some parts yeah. of it are really, really helpful. It is pretty good, and nobody talks about that one. But you know what one they really don't talk about is the one in between understanding comics and making comics that was like dated in two years. It's like called re Reimagining Comics. Have you ever seen yeah. that one? Yeah. yeah. Hey, he's, he's so great. It's like you can have a, I think he's entitled to a bad book. I mean, yeah, totally. Yeah, you know. he's had a couple bad books, you know, but um, also making comics by Linda Berry. Linda Berry's work about writing, she's a comics teacher um, at University of Madison, Wisconsin. Her stuff is super good for writing exercises. I've really learned a lot from those. Um, and they're, they're, she's, she's great. It's great. I would really recommend that too. Um, but yeah. and I think that I think you can find making comics by Scott McCloud as a PDF as well. Cool. Um, yeah. Funny because when you start like with you, you write yourself as a character often, and then that character evolves a little bit. You know how they move and how they dress and what facial expressions they make, and they're pretty they're pretty like elastic. Like you can kind of draw them in different styles. And I relate to that too. It's like the more you write a character, the more you relate to it. And the old school model is that you would read comics like Charlie Brown and they'd have a fictional character. And every year they would understand it more. Like in, in Charlie Brown, you read the early ones, he didn't know who the characters were. But that's kind of what's easier. That, that process has always seemed really hard to do for me, but writing a stand-in for myself is really a lot. I know how to write that first. Um, and I, uh, I kind of do both, like my character, you can change like your name just a little bit and then you're writing a fictional version of yourself. And then it's kind of like, you can enjoy writing a fictional character that you can do anything with, but also feel free to delve deeply into autobiograph autobiography. Yeah. Who else? All right, we, um, let me briefly show you the, the kids' comics and we'll let you go. But we, we did, I hope I got a picture of everybody's stuff. I apologize if your stuff isn't in this thing, but Carolyn did such a good presentation. And um, we like being able to actually have her print your work or whatever is probably above and beyond like what uh, her time would, would should allow. But I want to at least show you their comics. Because these are like the first comics for some people. And a lot of you yeah. are curious. Um, okay, so I'm going to Zoom. I'm going to go to share screen. And after after y'all are done with stuff, I'm more than happy to take a look at it too. Like, that sounds great too. You know, if you want to send me stuff in a week or two or whatever.
All right. Where is your old address? Uh, was it was it Sarah? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. This is Sarah's comic. Uh, kind of reminds me of yours in some ways with the text and the kind of way that she's cramming it with comics within comics. Yeah, I like the way how it's split up. How the panels that are connected to each other are their own thing, and then the space in between the panels show which one's different. <laughs> Look at that. It just like, ends like it's like this existential, just life goes on kind of ending. I love that. It's yeah, really, that really I hate when people stretch for a punchline. Like you don't always have to have a it's like funnier to not have a funny punchline, not an obvious funny punchline at least. And then down here, I was recommending, oh yeah, you could do another little comic. I told her about Tony Millionaire. I used to do tiny comics at the bottom of Makey's. And I came over the next day, and she'd come up with this. It's inspired. That rules. I'm, you know, I. It's so sick that y'all are making comics in high school. Like, I wish I had made comics in high school. I don't know. Like. Uh, oh yeah, you sent me this one. Oh yeah, yeah. Since one was done, I sent this this from Kaylin. And uh, yesterday, she'd only done the first two frames. So you can see how it turned out. I like the pop of color. So, yeah, there's something really appealing about these characters. And also, Kaylin has a really confident way of doing um, vegetation. Like even here, though it's not really about landscape, she's done a lot of really cool things where she loves to draw grass and trees and she has her own method for it. She's also um, super good at doing outline drawings with no outlines. Like usually this, that, if that's done badly, you can make the whole image fall apart. And, but everybody kind of wants to do that. And I love the way that it, everything hangs together where she want, where she needs it to hang together. And her lettering is so cool. Yeah. Um, and then this one is by um, uh, Abigail. Well, you know, you're Abigail. Um, it is um, Rosalina. This one's yours, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is just an excerpt. Totally. I like the swoosh. I like the, that's really cool perspective. You can really feel like the movement, you know? Yeah. Can you tell what's making the swoosh? I can't. Okay. So that's what we're working on. It's all the heads whipping around. Okay. Cool. I couldn't tell if they all had the same haircut or if they were moving, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and the first page, it's right in the, it's probably in the middle of it. Context probably would have told you what you needed. Uh, that it was the, the, the turn of the head. Definitely. Oh, wait, this is the beginning of it. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is the beginning. Okay, with the context, yes. Yeah, yeah totally. Cool. So successful, right? Definitely. I just needed the establishing shots, you know? I like the way you draw the nose. It's so cute. Yeah. Especially with where it's connected to like the little frown. It's really good. Oh, hell yeah. And then this one is, um, uh, how do I, how do I, I'm saying it wrong. Um, 
So this one, yes, it's not really a comic, it was for perspective drawing right from today, but it's pretty amazing, right? Totally. I like the legs a lot. It's really sick. Good line work. Everybody in here is really good. At, it's funny, I often start by having people do value scales and I show them how to do hatching. And I, I didn't do it this class, but everybody's really good at it. Like look at the way she really filled in that black, the the black of the window, window frame. So nicely done. Definitely. I like the ponytail a lot too. Wait, did I? Um, and then this one is um, Dorian's. Um, hey, so I'll, I'll kind of zoom in. This one's really intimate. Great hair. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's really good. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah it's so subtle it's just like all these jokes are not like they're all they'll knock you over the head and then um then i need i'm sorry i need my roster um it's uh um it's uh i know it does because i'm thinking i can use Good lettering, right? We Definitely. I really like the like head grabbing one that I think is the next panel. Yeah. That's, that's great. Tight. It's a really good anti face. You know, it's like it's there and not there. Like, I like it. Is there going to be? Maybe one more panel of her just kind of sitting there processing it more. But this is really funny. Expect and considering. So I gave them a little bit of a script to follow. The, the assignment was a character. Somebody says, what kind of work do you want to do? And a, a teacher or a friend or a ghost or whatever, or a unicorn. And they go, what kind of work do I want to do? And then they process the question. They come up with an answer. And then you show them doing it. And so this is kind of an interesting, like different pacing, turning it inside out, really exploring how to stage, write, and direct a sequence. Yeah, maybe right here in that skinny little space, just one more shot of her eyes or something, or maybe a shot of her shot of the person and the black spirit that they're talking to. I love also this character has this abstract scribble and how kind of ambiguous and menacing this is. You can even do like two tiny panels in that little space of like one of her with like the pencil about to draw and the other of her starting to draw. Yeah. yeah. Or just be... to stare. Yeah, or just a stare. Yeah. And one second. I like the way you shaded her hair too. Like in the the more finished. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just like the part of my brain that stores their names is being really is being really tapped. Um, that was uh. Eleanor, I was at Eleanor. Nice. And then this one, whose was this again? Oh, this, uh, that, that is um, 
Annabella. And do I have this crop weird? I, oh, it's over here. This is very JoJo's Bizarre Adventure to me. I love you if you go back and figure out how to spell weird. I do that a lot. Good for a Awesome. I love the kind of rumpled look of all the characters, the little kind of like dimples that get their faces texture and a sense of it's like muscles under the skin. And the way that's kind of the little nervous lines going through the hair, all those are great touches. Yeah. And I really just like the big question marks. You know? Mm -hmm. And this is excellent. So I spent a lot of time talking to kids about how to do the kind of manga energy explosion. And it is really important to go right to the edge of the page that you did. I don't remember if we talked about it, but this is a real this is a really good version of it. I often have to really instruct people to really press those lines right up against the border. And I mean, look how they go behind the question box too. Yeah. <laughs> Who's this? Is? Um, Charlotte, right? Yeah, great. And that's um, Olive. Then who did this one? Who, oh, it is. Oh, this is a, this is either being met before. Um, who's asking the questions about about some uh, writing? Yes. Yeah, this is great. It's great. And it's the first one that was done in class. I think you, yeah, you did this like immediately. Yeah. Yeah. You should, you should print this out. You should make some copies. You know, <laughs> this looks really nice. I love the signature. Yeah, it's really cute. Oh. Oh, really? Um, yeah, this might be my next tattoo. <laughs> I would get that. <laughs> yeah. I'd also get this one. I used to draw I used to draw noses really similar to how you're drawing noses on this. Forget who I was really looking at for it, but I just um go ahead. Oh, okay. Um have you it's like the like kind of over the garden wall adjacent nose, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? What um, garden wall was that? It's like a Cartoon Network mini series, um, kind of about Halloween, where they kind of have like triangle shaped noses, which is mm -hmm. sick. But um, no, this is really nice. I really like how expressive all the characters are in this. Yeah, super confident again. I mean, look at how carefully all the lines are connected. Like, really, this figure is really sealed together. Yes. And his hands are great. Also, the shadow under the face and the design of the, the character having this little kind of band that they wear around the neck. I like that too. I like their eyebrows. Yeah. And how it's like a star yeah. and a heart. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He had like consciously said it, uh, realized it. Cool. Oh, okay, cool. And this one was by, oh, remind me. Oh, um, this one was by uh, Beatrice, also who asked the question about self publishing, right? Yeah. Y'all should self publish these. These look great. Um. <laughs> Everything sucks. I like that the phone is dead. My phone is always dead too. Oh, 
Now we're talking. What, what I love about this, one of the many things, I love how the difference in the dog and the way the drawing of the dog. It looks just just different enough for me to believe that it was really done with this brush or this pencil. Yeah. That's really nice, dude. That's a that's a really nice page. Yeah, all of these are really kind of making it easy. They're doing a good everybody's doing a very good job also of anchoring things, these heavy blacks, the hair, the shadow under the face. There are all things that have to really push people to do. The closest you can get in a page for it being 50% black and 50% white, the more readable the page is typically. The more what it is? Like the more readable, uh, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, and you really, when you think, I, I think about it a lot. I, um, if you've ever read Scott, um, Brian Lee O'Malley does this really well um, in the original black and white ones using the black to move your eye across the page from panel to panel so especially when you get into more complicated and elaborate panel setups rather than like the traditional four six panel grid or whatever when you get to like panels on top of panels and sideways panels and all that stuff like using black to move the reader's eye across the page can be very make or break. So it's nice to see how much all of y'all are using like nice dark areas, you know? Yeah, and it's easier said than done because you can, I don't know, you can get into a cycle of endless revision. I'm not seeing people doing that either. Um, Ivy, is it sure? I don't know, we don't have one. Oh, I'm sorry. I said Ivy and then all of them. These are like two different things that grow on branches. Um, sorry, I meant all. Of and then, um, uh, yeah, this is aggressively drawn, right? Yeah, this is another really good example of like using black and white space. Look at that. We'll get the like little, beautiful. Um, uh, hair marks for the hair. That's great, especially zooming in. This would be a good T-shirt. Definitely. I really like how the legs are hanging over the panel too. You know, just so random. And that was like a part of it from. from I walked by her by her um, station, and she was putting that in really early. She just kept it. And you can see, like, even on the page, on the on this screen, look how much that one jumps out. Then there's yeah. other blacks. This one really has the blacks divvied all the way through every single form. Also, I think can we show you look at it or see it? Classic. Yeah, this is like the plot of my next comic. <laughs> great character designs too like look how different these two characters are and they're both like really wildly designed with this like wild expressive hair but it's wild expressive hair in, in a complete two completely different ways there's different makeup there's different eyes there's different um they even have the same uniform for the most yeah yeah but then they have different hair clips in different postures, yeah. Awesome. Oh. 
Oh, and then um, Rayhan, I didn't put yours up, but I put it on Instagram. The horrible stuff's going to come up on Instagram. Oh, and this one I skipped as well. And I skipped this one. So this is Ray Hong. These comics are also great. You guys are all clearly working really hard. <laughs> right? And that's, yeah, this is the one that really has nice, confident uh, etching. Um, it's a big uh, folk fan. Ray, Ray Hong. Either we're talking about your work, okay? So, um, yeah, we were just both uh, commenting on how many things we like about this. It's a, it's a really interesting, another like kind of anti humor comic. Um, comic you had to make, <laughs> did you notice he called it that? What do you want to draw today? I want to draw a graveyard. I, I like how these people's floating. Oh, it is? Yeah. And then there's the graveyard. And then, Liz, was this one yours? Okay, so let, um, yeah, this is with, but I only have the fragment of it. Do you have it over there? Whoa. Good emotion. Definitely. Oh. <laughs> cool. Are these the characters that you invented? Have you, have you worked with them before? I don't know. This is great. I like how many panels there are on one page. Yeah. And it's really easy to read them in the right order. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is great. Um, you know? I like the way the blacks are applied. This is so amazing where the black is like really carefully carving out the figure. Yeah. But this works too well. This works well too. And I like that with this one, that you don't just have the stabby blacks that are brushy. You also have places where it pushes right up against the edge. So you kind of have both going on. The clean blacks you kind of make it a nice crisp shade, like where they put, push right up against that text box and also the brushy ones for expressiveness. So the way that you're applying wax is varied. And I, I dig that a lot. And I love the way that you're getting like, you know, the plot and what it's about, like that being like one of your goals that you're achieving it. So many people here, I feel like I'm skipping somebody. Um, uh, Gina, did we go over here? And, and B, did we go over here? Can we share any benefits of progress? Yeah. Wow. Whoa, what's that night? Oh. Because... So, if you're, you're going to be on the camera. Yeah. Um, what kind of light are you using? Um, 
<laughs> the paradox of uh that is really well done and it's just amazing the way that we are going the extra mile to show you speaking. Have you seen that before? Or have you seen that before? Um, we have used that in all scope. Um, I've been telling them to not just see like boring 93 lines, and this is really active. And then, oh, then we do it now. So, Yeah, 